So I thought uh, this would be a good topic, and it actually is, is timely since I'm going to be discussing this in a couple of weeks in Chicago at a meeting of rheumatology fellows that's held annually. They asked me to talk about this. I guess at least the uh, people in the practice or in rheumatology training that are mostly going into practice are interested in this. And I think, let me just get a quick show of hands. How many have a CV? How many have, how many have a resume? Uh -huh. Okay, so we've got a mix, and we'll talk about the difference. So everybody has some interest and need for this. This is sort of our one of our academic calling cards. If you stay in academic medicine, having your CV and continuing to update your CV is really kind of the, the, the hallmark of, of sort of who you are in, in academics. And it also relates to many things in the workforce. And so what I wanted to do is just kind of walk through with you uh, a couple of facets of this, and I, I don't have anything specific to disclose about this other than to provide thanks to a couple of colleagues, particularly Robin Lorenz here at UAB, and one of my former colleagues and still collaborator, Jerome Allison, who's at UMass. And also, uh, this is, and I'll make these slides available to you, we'll, we'll get these circulated, but um, these are important links. The, the one is the UAB website to get the, uh, the format for these, and then the other is the University of Massachusetts uh, website, which has a slightly different format, but also some interesting additional instructions, and I've kind of concatenated things. One of the things you'll find, particularly in academic centers, is, is that there's not a standard way to do this. There's a lot of similarity and a lot of consistency, but there's some variability. And so some of the things I want to do is share with you things that I think are fairly standard, and then also highlight some things that you might want to consider that are um, indeed a bit variable. And then the last uh, link is actually an interesting website where I found some material from uh, University of Tennessee in Memphis that uh, will become apparent in just a minute because there are some very interesting critiques of CVs from some of the people that were reviewing them there that I want to show, show you. So I want to make a distinction. I, I ask you about both CVs and resumes. And so what's the difference between a CV and a resume? So a resume is a much more concise document that is used to market your skills and to get you an interview. But it's very concise and it's very easy to scan. And that is in contrast to the CV. The CV is a much more extensive document that lists your education, your research, teaching, publications, presentations. You know, it's been said that uh, you know, if we're interviewing somebody for an administrative post, a division director, a chairman, you, you know, the heavier the CV, the sort of more gravitas that person to some degree has. I mean, it obviously depends what's in there, but the CV can be, you know, hundreds of pages long in some cases for given individuals. So for doing resumes, here are some just general suggestions. You want to keep it very consistent, very precise, a uh, page, maybe two pages, uh, your most impressive experiences, you, you have some words in there that talk about what you're interested in, what, what you're planning to do, what are your, what are your objectives, and it gets, tends to be targeted to the job that you're applying for. So it's a much different document than the CV. The CV, again, all your experience is very lengthy. It tends to be consistent. You don't modify this for the job that you're applying for. And one of the challenges that we all face is keeping it updated. And if you have assistance that can help you, that's great. Otherwise, when you're starting out, you're probably going to be doing that on your own. And you know, one of the things to do is just, uh, if, you know, if you're writing papers and uh, busy giving presentations, sometimes it can actually be challenging to make sure that it stays updated. So you have to work at that and just tend to um, you know, take care of it over time to, to keep it updated. So I don't think this requires too much commentary other than to say that this is an opportunity for you to make a positive impression. This is the first exposure that someone may have to you. And if you're going to be starting a new job or applying for a new position, this is your, your introduction and your chance to to get an interview. And if it looks messy or there's mistakes in it or typos or some other things that we'll talk about that might distinguish it as not being positive, that could maybe impair your ability depending on uh, the, the competition to get your foot in the door. <clears throat> a 
well organized, easy to follow. And the second bullet will be a recurrent theme. Make sure you account for all your time. If you've had a gap, if you've done something, took, it, took time off, went and studied overseas, did an experience that uh, is not accounted for in your CV, make sure that you are prepared either to explain that in the cover letter or potentially to discuss it during an interview. So now let's get into some of the details. And um, I want to just kind of walk you through this. This is sort of the, the format, and then I'm going to give some examples and, and show how this might look. So the top is pretty standard information. Uh, some suggestions are to – now, there's a bit of a debate, rather, about your personal contact information. If it's an internal document, some would suggest that for security purposes, you might not want to provide it. If you're applying for a position outside of your institution, people – are going to want to know how to get in touch with you and probably going to want to include that. You're going to want to list your actual degrees, but you don't put particularly personal information in there about your, your birth date, gender, race, religion, marital status, disability. These are things that are not included and they're not part of a, a job selection process. So those should not be included in it, nor should sensitive personal information like your social security number. You don't want Want that floating around. And then you're going to list your education. You're going to put your appointments and employment. We'll come back to what sorts of employment you want to illustrate, depending again on the position that you're applying for. If you've received um, honors and awards, those will also be listed. And some of these categories are things that right now may not be terribly relevant, but are going to become more relevant as your, your career advances. Then that's followed by teaching. Are you doing educational things? Are you teaching courses? Have you given lectures? If you're lecturing outside of your institution, there's ways to organize that that I'll indicate. Uh, if you've had grant funding, if you've had non-funded research, and we'll, we'll come back to this and talk about that a little more, because I think for many of you that may be the case beyond uh, the, the T and the K awards that you might be supported by here. But you want to be careful about how you frame that. You want to list things that you're working on, but if you have a bunch of things that are unfinished, that may be uh, uh, a bit of a, a marker of things that, that need to be discussed. Healthcare delivery, if you're in that field, uh, things that you would list are listed here in terms of what sort of services you're delivering. Are you certified? Are you licensed? And then there's a few other categories that I thought were intriguing that were on the UMass website. Clinical innovation, safety and quality work, guidelines, and protocols. Those are all categories that they suggest be separate. I hadn't really thought about it in the past, but I think they're pretty interesting. And then lastly, your scholarship. And this takes all forms of publications, abstracts, things you might put online, software. For the presentations at professional meetings, the abstracts, the, the best way to list these is as a, a citable abstract. If it's actually a proceeding from a conference, those are generally published, and you ought to actually list the, the volume. Usually they're a supplement to a, a journal, so that'll actually have a page number with it. That's much better than saying uh, Society of General Internal Medicine, 2016. Put the actual publication in the Journal of General Internal Medicine where it was actually published. And usually the most common recommendation is to put it in reverse chronological order if it's short and in chronologic order if it's long. Reverse chronologic is easier for people to read, but if you've got many, many publications or many, many abstracts, it may be easier as you're building your CV just to put them all at the end. Lastly is uh, professional memberships and activities if you've done any editorial work. And other external professional services. So these are things that relate to your skills in your area. If you've done grant reviews, been on advisory boards, done expert services and consulting, important community services, other services that involve your professional expertise. All right, so here's just my CV. I'll give you a few examples from mine, and then I'm going to show you a couple of our fellows in, in rheumatology. They were kind enough to share some examples with me. And you can see just the standard stuff at the top of the page. Always a little embarrassing when I have no foreign languages, but I like to try to someday remedy that. 
Uh, and so that, you know, all pretty standard stuff, right? So your education, how do you organize that? So your different degrees, your postdoctoral training, the years, the, the institutions. One of the things that's that's good to work on is a very standardized format. Be consistent in how you show it all you know, throughout the document. And yours may vary a little bit from somebody else's, but if it's consistent internally, that's really quite helpful. Here's an example from one of my um, fellows in rheumatology who was uh, provided this. You can see he's listed the places where he's trained, his board certification, his licensure, all very clearly defined on his CV. So that looks looks quite good. And then just another example. Uh, let's see here. What are a couple of the things I wanted to point out here? I was a little inconsistent, I noticed, with the way I did the dates. You know, you can do, depending on... Um, the position, you know, you might list a month and a year, but and these are sort of minor things. But again, it's attention to detail. You're trying to really highlight that you're very detail oriented in preparing this. So you want to be consistent with with how you do that. And then this was from my colleague's CV, listing some of his awards. Looks good. List those publications. So let's look at that. So peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, preprints, policy statements, non-peer-reviewed publications, non-print online materials. You can use different categories to break this up, and there's different ways that people do this. This was from the UMass website. thought this was a nice way to divide it up. One of the key things that I see a lot of in looking at uh, that CVs, particularly early on, is, is that peer review publications pick up some noise. So they get review articles in there, they get abstracts thrown in there. And the, the concern when you see that is somebody's trying to expand their publications in peer review when they really are not peer review. So if you're going to put them all together, then clarify that with the heading and don't call them peer review. But I think uh, you can you know, separate those out. Often there's another category that, that I use, which is uh, reviews and editorials, where you'd have a review paper, a letter to the editor, something like that as a separate section. How do you feel about including um, papers that are submitted or that are in progress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's often a separate section. At the very end, papers uh, in preparation. And something, once it's actually been accepted, then it goes in the main section. It says accepted in press online first, one of those ways to sort of categorize it. What do you recommend? I mean, I guess for trainees, I feel like that's totally appropriate. Yeah. I feel like once you get past maybe your first year especially, I, I guess I feel like that. Kind yeah, you of could. I guess that's that. a good point. So you could, you could amalgamate those. I think that would be okay. Again, it's the same point. And you'll see some comments from some of the reviewers from University of Tennessee, Memphis, who were concerned that there were a lot of things that were in preparation. And so it's always, you know, it's always fairly easy to say you're working on these 10 things, but how many of them are you actually going to get done? And so you have to be a little careful, at least prepared to talk about that at the time of an interview. So I think there, there's a, a sweet spot for that, to be sure. All right, so this would be um, a way to show the publications. Often you highlight your name and where you are in the author list. Uh, all the authors get listed. There, uh, here are the PMIDs are listed. If you want to pull those in, you can see some of these had not yet been out in hard copy, so they're listed as EPUB ahead of print. And um, you know, the, the consistency as best you can in terms of the formatting. I'm noticing now as I look through this that in some of the references, there are all caps for each word, and, and others they're not. I mean that's a relatively minor critique, but you know, if I was really even more attentive to the detail, I'd go through and make that consistent. Consistency of format to show that attention to detail is really important. Using the standard abbreviations for the journals is also perfectly fine. Presentations. So if you're giving talks, even if you come to this session and uh, give a presentation, I think that's perfectly reasonable to list that as Friday Fellows list what you talked about. You Often I try to do these in a standard way. I list the name of the meeting, I list the title and the location of the meeting, and um, I think you get the sense of this. 
pretty well. Now, some people break this into different groupings. If you're doing a lot of speaking, uh, you may have a separate section that is local, another one that's regional, another one that might be national or international. You could have lectures and you know courses that you're teaching as a separate section. That, that often separates out into sort of that educational area rather than than uh, presentations outside of courses. But um, you can look at some examples of that as well on the on the websites. Professional development, groups that you're involved with that relate to your expertise. So here are some examples from mine and from my fellows. Now this actually I think is a mistake on his that I wanted to just briefly mention. I would have put this under honors and awards. Take advantage of that as best as you can. Things that if you are elected into an honorary society, put that under your honors and awards rather than as a society membership. It's a, a little bit more credit for it, if you will, in that category. So these are often groups that you interact with, you come to their meetings, you're a member of these groups, you might have a position designation within the group, you might be a fellow or a member, so you list, list that on your CV. So how does the resume differ? What are some things that you would include in the resume that you might not include in the CV? And these are a couple examples of that. You could have your profile and your summary of qualifications. This is just an example from a person who's training in rheumatology and wants to become a clinician in that area, how they might express their interest and skills. Bulleted, short, concise, action-oriented. Now, this is interesting, and I think this is, at this stage, a little bit uh, variable for how you're going to want to do this, but there's going to be things that you've done that aren't truly in your field, but they're important because they show that you've had work experience, perhaps, or that you've had a diverse experience, that you've had leadership experience, that you've done something that broadens you and makes you uh, better suited to take on a, a new position. And so it could be a student worker, you know, here they listed being a server at Applebee's. Um, you know, that's, that's okay, I think, early on, if you've done something relevant during that experience. You've had some training experience, you've had some management experience, you've done something administrative, I think that would be perfectly fine early in your career to list some of these things. But ultimately, you're going to want to gradually weed some of that out as you have more professional experiences to fill in. Here's some other examples, related experiences, non-paid positions. I think this would be very highly appropriate to list things where you've done volunteer work, in an intern uh, work if you're trying to apply to become uh, some sort of a care provider and showing that you worked in a crisis nursery and as a child guidance counselor and listing some of the things you did in the resume. The resume, you explain this in more detail, the CV you just listed as a line item. And then what about references? So these often are provided separately and sometimes only if requested. When you seek to get references, you want to make sure that the people you're getting the references for know that you're going to be asking for a reference. It's a little bit of a surprise sometimes when I get a call or Emily gets a call saying, would you provide a reference for so-and-so? We're always glad to do it, but it's nice to know what is it that you're applying for, what's the purpose of the, the reference that you're providing so that if you do end up either writing a letter or talking to someone, you're well-versed in what the, uh, the goals are and the objectives. So to summarize the CV, a few suggestions. Make sure you proofread it and spell check it. It's good to get feedback from others in your area. Uh, if you send one out, make sure you follow up. <clears throat> a few suggestions on things not to do. Talked about a few of these already. Don't make it real flashy or use a bunch of sort of flowery stuff in there. I think just keep it very professional. And I wouldn't put a lot of experience in there, at least um, <clears throat> later on, that is not um, 
related to the job that you're applying for, make sure that it looks professional in terms of the, the quality of any hard copies that you might distribute. So now I'm going to share with you a few anecdotes. These are some quotes from um, some of the faculty at UT Memphis. I actually know a few of these people. Laura Carbone is a colleague of mine. And um, the online uh, link to the URL that I provided at the beginning is to a, a, a lecture from one of their postdocs. And she actually sent around some C questionnaires to some of the faculty and said, when you review CVs, what are some of the biggest problems you see? So I thought this would be useful for you to see. Spelling errors, no organization, poor organization, incorrect terminology, not separating abstracts from papers, not using in press, things we've talked about, not having separate sections, too much personal stuff. I don't think cooking hobbies, et cetera, belong on CVs. And now when you read these comments, you're going to see there's some variability in what people are looking for. That's not surprising. And then this point that I made earlier, avoid major lapses and discontinuity in your career. If you've had to take time off, explain why. Avoid too much personal stuff. Stick to professional matters. Maybe a few lines of extracurricular interests. Poorly presented, disorganized. I don't find a goal statement particularly helpful on a CV. This is, again, I think that distinction from a resume, although one of the things you'll see is some people kind of combine the formats a little bit, and you can have a little bit of creativity in this depending on where you're applying. If it's academic, I'd stick to the very strict format of that institution, but if you're sending it out for a job in the private sector, there may be some variability. And you can see some of the other comments here as well. Same comment, gaps need to be avoided, count for all time, follow through. It's a big red flag when people have frequently changed positions for responsibilities. Overstatement of the achievements. Make sure that you have material to support it. It will look very bad at the time of the interview if you have multiple projects in a pending status. So let's, let me summarize and then just uh, put a couple more comments in about a few other things that are related to this. So your CV is a descriptive document which lists out all the details about your career. Your resume is a snapshot. The CV is comprehensive. The resume is concise. The CV is generally not customized. The resume is dynamic, changes according to the job. The CV is suitable when applying for academic positions, advanced research, the resume may be what you use when applying for jobs in the private sector, such as in clinical practice. CV focuses on your expertise. The resume concentrates on contributions, how you've worked, how you've made a difference, where you've worked. Questions about resumes and CVs? Comments, suggestions, other things that you've experienced? How far back would you suggest we go, dates-wise, for putting mm -hmm. um, jobs or things like that? I think it's okay to go back quite a ways. Now, I mean, I don't know that you need to necessarily go back to, you know, what you did part-time in high school, unless it was really interesting and exciting and you think it would be relevant. I would ask the question each time you add something is, what's the point you're trying to make? What are you trying to tell about yourself? What's the, what does it add that says something new about you? I mean, if you taught English as a foreign language, that would be pretty interesting. I'd like to know about that if you did that when you were in high school. I think that'd be fine. Um, on the other hand, if you know you were a babysitter or you know worked at Arby's, I'm not sure that that would help me as much unless you had a management role or were doing something really extraordinary in that circumstance. Um, kind of getting nitpicky, but for dates. Mm -hmm. So I've seen it done multiple ways. Um, so for January, for instance, 01 or February 02. Um, do you put a dash or a slash, um, and then 2018 or just 18? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, or just as long as you're consistent. I think I, my advice would be just be consistent. Make it look pretty. Make it look professional. And uh, you, you may find yourself at a place where they want it in a very particular way. And I would go if you're going to apply to a university or you're going to apply to an academic institution, uh, find their format. Go on their website and see what their CV looks like. Dress it up so that you're trying it on. Show them what the, if you were at their place, what what would your stuff look like? Hopefully, there's not a lot of tweaking that's needed to put it into that format. 
we have a format. Massachusetts has a format. I imagine UT, Tennessee, uh, uh, Memphis has a format. Just check it out and try to move it into that format if you're going to apply it to that particular place. Suma? How, uh, so how many is too many for you know, publications under, uh, uh, you know, in progress or those kind of things? Uh, yeah, so I think Emily alluded to that a little bit earlier. And I mean, how many do you think you can really be working on at the same time? Right. And so the question would be, if they're all really things that you're actively engaged in, then that would be fine. If you had more than, say, 10, oh. I would say, hmm, it seems a little diffuse. Are they really focused? And why is it taking them so long to get their papers oh. finished? So I'm thinking in terms of papers, uh, three to five, maybe, typically, might be uh, the right amount. And that's actually pretty good if you're really working on three to five papers. I mean, a good production is three to five papers a year for somebody at an early stage. That's great. So that would be reasonable. What do you think, Emily? Yeah, I mean, I think that sounds reasonable. So, I mean, uh, I would be right. So, for a junior person, I think three to five. I'd be really surprised to see it unless it was like a guideline or something on a more senior person's resume. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know, if you had like one or two that have been that are say under review and two to three that are in progress, something like that? Yeah, and I think that's a nice little distinction. Under review is more powerful than in preparation. Yeah. If you really sent it out, that's great. Mm -hmm. So it shows that it's moved beyond the manuscript stage as something that you've submitted. Under re-review, why not? If it's under re-review, if you send it back in a second time and it hasn't been accepted yet, put it in there. So it's a chance to kind of brag about who you are, but you want to be factual. Back things up with the facts. What are the facts about you? And don't leave people wondering whether you're making unsubstantiated claims. Um, so uh, for the publication section, uh, is there a way to, or should you even indicate like co-authorship if you have a publication where everyone worked on the same, it's just kind of alphabetical? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, and, uh, I've seen that on grants as well. It might say multiple PI, or it could say, uh, you know, both first author or, or uh, you know, senior author status. And there's different ways that you can put that often in parentheses. But that's right. You could, uh, if it's a team. So, and, and one of the things that might happen is you could have a group that wrote a paper, and your name is actually not listed, but you can put next to it a member of working group or something. Just list yourself there. Just explain it. I often see it with an asterisk, so like there'd be like an asterisk that would say, you know, joint first authors, or, you know, um, so for one that I saw, it was like, you know, the cancer, uh, cancer genome atlas, something like that, and so they don't get named authors, but it's like, you know, that, that person was the direct the big piece of it, so there's an asterisk. So, 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 you know, very briefly, like three or four words with the, with the world class. Let me just bring up a couple more things, and then we'll have plenty of time to discuss this, and we're going to end early today unless there's uh, other things that we want to cover. Uh, so often with your CV comes a cover letter, and the idea is, is to introduce the CV and to introduce yourself if you're applying for a job. You want to express enthusiasm, passion, if you will, for what you're applying for. You might want to mention in the letter how what you want to do is relevant to your interests and abilities, how you're... Uh, how the position fits your values or interests. The other thing that I want to just talk about very briefly is letters of support and the ask. When you're asking someone for a letter of support, which often accompanies applying for a job, you want to make sure you're clear about what it is that you want, why you're asking that particular person. It may be very clear if that's been your primary mentor. Or it may be less clear if it's a co-mentor or somebody that you know less well through perhaps a course you took. And you want to provide them with all the relevant details and all relevant supporting docs, so, which I'll mention in a second. And, and the bottom bullet is a, a personal preference, but I think a fairly standard one. And that is if you're asking somebody who's moderately busy and they know you moderately well, ask them whether you can write a draft of it. If it's not a blinded letter, people appreciate that. And I'll often ask somebody who is asking me for a letter, can you draft it? I learn a lot when somebody drafts their own letter. Uh, sometimes they're very uh, humble. They don't say much glowing about themselves, and I have to embellish it a lot. And sometimes they're the opposite. <laughs> then it's a little more embarrassing because you got to edit it down. 
<laughs> and uh, you know, it's, it's tone it down a little bit. But um, I think it can. It's a good experience to to write some of these. And you'll notice in many of them that there's a lot of code. Um, my letters all end sort of the same way. Whether I support somebody, I strongly support somebody. I, uh, you know, I'm very excited about them. Uh, I use more flowery terms that I, um, you know, ex extremely pleased to recommend without reservation. So there's different terms that you'll see in sort of the conclusion of these letters that often sort of tells the, the reader how uh, excited that person is and sometimes how well they know that person. Here are some of the supporting docs that you may want to include. Your CV, sometimes a writing sample depending on the job, perhaps an abstract of those can often be found. Uh, these are different things that you could provide to the person writing the letter if they need this information. Uh, and, and the other thing, when you ask if it's not somebody you know very well, it's perfectly fine and very appropriate to say, can you write me a positive letter? Can you write me a good recommendation? And it really <clears throat> provides some transparency in what you're expecting. And it's not, if it's a, at all possible, and, and you're the one who's going to be submitting it, get the letter back and read it. And if you don't think it's what you were looking for, you may ask multiple people. You may not decide to use that one. Maybe the person really didn't know you well enough or... Sometimes the letters say more about the writer than about the person. They just may not write very good letters of support. They may not have had a lot of experience in writing those. And specify when you need it, right? Give your writer plenty of lead time, let's say a month on average. Don't be afraid to remind your writer about the deadline. Never assume, but don't send ransom letters. <laughs> All right, good. So that's what I had to present on this. And uh, again, we have a little more time and we can end a little early on Good Friday. Any other comments about CVs, resumes, cover letters, letters of support? There's many in the room that have had a lot of experience in this space. Any? Becky and others want to make comments? Yes. So something that I've been asked twice to do was write a student letter of support for a faculty member. And I feel like I was pretty ill prepared to do so. So what would you include in that? I mean, I really just talked about in my experience with that educator, but I don't know if there's something else I should have expanded on. So you were writing a letter of support for somebody who was maybe a, trying to get promoted or tenure yeah, or something? Yeah, and I didn't, it was very, you know, clinical year. Yeah, yeah. So, but it was, I actually got asked twice because I didn't know if it's a common thing or kind of what well, to it's do. probably a compliment to you. They must Googling. have thought you were a more <laughs> student. Uh, yeah, I haven't had, haven't seen that too much, but uh, yeah, so you're sort of, and, and I guess that could be in a way, feel a little bit funny and because you're sort of in yeah. an interesting position, although I suspect it's post the time that you've taken the class and that person doesn't have any further influence in terms of grading you or providing yeah, yeah. further feedback. So that's less an issue. And was it a blinded letter? No, I sent it back to them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In sure, no, that's, sure, we've all actually, in, I, I had to do that too for in different things that you might yeah. apply for an award or something where you want to get letters from your, your colleagues or people that you've trained. And I think the thing is just to be candid and to talk about something that doesn't show up in their CV. Okay. That's really what a good letter of support should do. Uh, people can go through and you know, regurgitate the CV and put all the different degrees and places they've trained. That's not very helpful. But. People can get that from reading the CV, but you want to, in the letter of support, you want to talk about um, how they, how hard they work, how smart they are. You know, do they ca catch things very quickly? What is it? How do they work with other people? If there's too much about sort of their personality and behavior and attitude, not enough about their aptitude and knowledge, that can be a little bit of a, a an indicator too that that you don't want. To, there may be some things that are left unsaid. In certain letters, and you know, as you read letters for people applying for positions, periodically you pick up typically not red flags because red flags don't often show up in letters of support. If they do, you've got a real problem, but often yellow flags, things that catch your eye and say, Hmm, that's kind of a strange way to say that. Uh, you know, continue to improve. Um, it's okay if it's stated maybe once, but if it's sort of a theme of the letter that they continue to improve in this, they continue to improve in that may suggest that maybe their performance level is not that great. 
Uh, so those are some of the things you'll pick up as you read through the letters. Other comments? Yeah, so I guess I, I'm a little curious what your thoughts are, um, especially like early in career and balancing um, you know, abstract conference presentations and actual publications. And you typically look to see if there's continuity between mm. you know, this abstract right, kind of uh, presentation yeah. to moving forward to this yep, publication. Yep, yep, yep. So that could be a bit of a yellow flag, right? So generally, you want to list everything. So you want to have all your abstracts on there. But yes, it, and that's a, a, good, a good lesson for everybody that if you have something you've presented, Often it should move on to publication. So if you've presented 50 abstracts and you've got five papers, that's kind of a message. You're, you're not a finisher, so get the papers out. When you write an abstract, it's, it's the best thing about an abstract is you got a deadline. So you get the get the abstract done because it's due at a certain time. Papers don't have deadlines, so it should be a way for you to organize your thinking around that particular body of work and put your mark down and then move on from there to the paper. Sometimes the paper is not easy to get published because maybe it's a negative result on a topic that has less significance. And so it may be hard, but work hard to get the papers out. How about paper presentation and the poster presentation on the conference? Mm -hmm. I think it really ties into the same section on abstracts. If it's a poster, or an oral presentation or national meeting or a regional meeting, it goes under the abstracts. And typically, it would be, uh, if it's a major meeting, most of those meetings will publish the proceedings of the meeting in a, 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 a supplement often to the major journal of that society. Sometimes if it's a smaller meeting, it may not be published, so you may have to just list it. And I would con uh, consider creating a separate section for um, unpublished abstracts and, and proceedings and meetings. This might be more relevant for resumes than CVs, but do you have any insight on kind of the use on the end of HR for algorithms, software, you know, things that can prevent you from getting to the next phase, even though you hmm. didn't know it was something that could prevent you from getting to the next stage? Because yeah. I've kind of been given the advice, like, if, you know, there's a call for a position, you make sure those keywords end up in the resume you send. But I don't think all institutions necessarily use that sort of software or algorithm. Yeah. No, I think I think you highlighted the issue. And um, in certain positions where there's a lot of applications and where people are being judged uh, more widely from a large pool of people that are submitting, uh, that may very well be the case. For many of the positions that I think you in the room are going to be applying for, it's going to be a little more personalized. It's, it often, for academic positions, is uh, you may be requested to submit your CV, or you may see an ad in a journal, uh, your journal in your area, where they're looking for people with that particular background. And I think you'll get a pretty personal look. Uh, and I hope you will coming out of a place like this. And I would be surprised if they, they do that in that setting. But, but over across the street in the Red Building, if you're applying to be, um, you know, in a non-professional position or even you know, some of the lower-level professional positions, that, that may be the case. And I'm, I think your suggestion sounds good. Uh, does anybody else have experience with that, Emily? So I would say for academics, you know, it's not it's not algorithmic, but it, you should talk about the department and the field, right? So a lot of us are very multidisciplinary, so people might not be applying, applying exactly in the field where you, you know, your PhD or your doctorate is in something. Um, I will say I was on a biostat search committee where there were a lot of people who didn't say anything about biostatistics or public health, and that was in their cover letter. And they might have been qualified, or they probably, you know, they were quantitatively quite strong, but that was an easy way. You know, we had. 100 applicants, and if you said you have your degree in engineering and you don't say anything about public health or biostatistics. So the cover letter is the opportunity to have yeah. okay. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, so great, great comment. And uh, I've been on a couple of um, leadership search committees, a dean search and a recent search for a, a vice chair for research. And as Emily said, the people apply that have all sorts of different backgrounds. And the first question is often, why are they applying? You know, what is their qualification? 
And the cover letter should really explain that. It, it ought to be segmented even to talk about some of the key things that that person thinks is important for them to do the job well. Their administrative abilities, their teaching experience, their research experience, some of the typical domains that they think would fit under the position description for taking that on, if they, particularly if their background is not traditional. So very important. How about the continued education, for example, uh, one day, two day workshop, or one week workshop, short training? Do I need short training? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you think it's relevant, I you know, I guess I look at it. And so part of the, the challenge is that if you create too much material, there's a signal noise issue. There are a lot of things in there that are not really all that exciting, then um, you know, people are going to have trouble finding the really good stuff that's in there. Okay. So if you're listing every sort of week-long or three-day workshop that you've attended, mm, I don't know. If you think it was really an exceptional thing and it really provided you with the skill that you want to make sure people know you have, and particularly if it led to a certificate or some kind of a notification that you completed it, then I would be inclined to include it, but I would be careful about too much of that. I, I would add to that and say that's a great jumping off point for your cover letter to say, I attended this seminar and it was so impactful to me, I want X, Y, and Z. So, you know, change it and, and reframe it to, to be a cover letter thing instead of a, a CV or a resume thing and add that paragraph in there. Good comment, thank you. I wonder if mentioning um, if there's a person who led it that's a leader in that area, that might be more impactful if you say, I spent a week with Ken Stagg at UAB doing X, Y, Z, you might say, oh, great, okay. Well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this will be relevant, but I've had that question before, and the advice that I received was for the ones that you sort of maybe received like a scholarship or something, um, you know, put those down as like an honors. But for the like statistical training where you, you know, just paid a fee, for example, and attended a three-day course, omit those, but try to put them in your cover letter again and say, I leverage this skill set to X, Y, Z. Excellent. What else? Everybody know how to tune out their CVs? Good. Coming back to the publications question that you asked earlier about transferring that abstract to a publication, I would say as you are writing your abstract to go to the conference, go ahead and find three or four journals that you want to list, that you want to submit to, so that once you're done with that conference, you can go back, make those edits real quick, and get it off your plate. Don't wait. Don't provide that lag time. Just go ahead and get in your in your mind mentally that that's part of your process of submitting an abstract, is having three or four journals in mind where you're going to submit. The longer that it stays in the hopper, the harder it is to get out there. That's a, a nice <coughs> summary, Becky, and I, I think it highlights that the CV is not just a marker of what you've done, but also it can also help you think about what you need to do. Mm -hmm. To the comment about the abstracts that are on there and the papers in preparation, and you might want to go through your CV once a month and update the papers that are in preparation. It forces you to think about what is it that you're working on, when, when do you need to get things finished. Excellent. Well, enjoy the rest of your morning. Anything else, Becky, John, Eve, that we wanted to cover? Any other announcements? Yep. Uh, well, we have practice training for our PL1 scholars for the ACTS conference. So I'd like for you guys to hang out if anyone wants to stay ah, and good. see okay. some poster presentations well, from great. these scholars. We'd love for you to stay and get feedback. Um, otherwise, we will see you next week and looking forward to it. Thank okay. you. There's coffee outside too. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So I like yeah. I'm just going to hold it to myself. No Short and sweet. <laughs> that is my goal. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do you guys want to come load yours? Yeah. <laughs> come do it.
like that's that's where I got to, and then like yeah. oh, it, I'm down. still like I revert back to Excel usually for like this hundred Excel too. I mean, I think they have a I guess I just downloaded it to download it to the, uh, the desktop. I already like found a spelling mistake. <laughs> I already misspelled, yeah, like and but I already sent it to myself. I was like, whatever at this point. Yeah, they're probably not even gonna be able to see it. That's true.
Two to three minutes. Yeah. Two to three minutes. Yeah. 